Bismillah. Um, today on this podcast, we're going to be talking about Lizzie Schofield's article in Finder Ministries, which, of course, is talking about an a, a ex-Muslim that converted to Christianity. So um, first, we're going to go through his background, which in reality is a typical background of a Muslim convert, which includes, of course, not being religious, having drugs and sex and all partying and what have you. Um, so Yahya, can you give us a background uh, or cover what he, uh, what's his background in Iran, what type of character he was? Yeah, I mean, uh, f firstly, um, it's important to mention this person is based in the UK now. So he's an Iranian. Alarm bells start ringing. I, I, and I, I can't take it seriously as a serious conversion story because uh, e even Christian pastors, they pretty much acknowledge that a lot of these uh, Iranians uh, come over here for a style and they pretend to convert. So Pastor Ektedarian uh, in in Liverpool, this is what he says when he was asked whether Iranians are pretending to convert to Christianity. He just said, yes, of course, people, plenty of people do this. I do understand there are a lot of mixed motives. There are many people abusing the system. So he, he's not ashamed to admit this. So his story is, um, it be, begins well beyond Lizzie Schofield meeting well, him. Can you tell us what uh, the benefits, sort of, uh, can you tell us what type of benefits that they would get? Like what would be the, the motivation of Muslims to actually pretend to convert? Oh in, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, this, this is common. This was acknowledged in Germany as well by uh, at least one pastor where there's a spate of conversions in Germany from uh, uh, amongst Iranian asylum seekers just to help with their asylum applications because this is the con. What they say is we've converted to Christianity. We're part of this such and such church now. If you send us back home, they're going to kill us. So, yeah. And invariably governments like Germany, the UK, they have some sort of obligation not to send them back because... Uh, of human rights, right? Mm. So that's that's the benefit they get, and then they get free housing, um, maybe some sort of uh, welfare, etc. I'm not too sure what what they get, but yeah. they do get some sort of material um, benefits, and they get permanent residency here. Um, but he, his story starts off as him being some sort some sort of uh, wild and out of control teenager, drugs, sex, rock and roll, drums, etc. What I found interesting is he mentioned something to do with this armed religious faction. But upon closer scrutiny, he's not part of some sort of religious faction. He was part of the army, right? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that was just a stereotypical you know, terrorism, ex-terrorism subject that he wanted to cover. Um, Ijaz, uh, can you explain more about this? Like the, I mean, the, the background, the psychology that Christians, they always want to hear Muslims being, a, you know, constantly barbaric in this barbaric lifestyle with, you know, guns, weapons, wanting to kill everybody. And then they're, you know, the, the heathen, the barbarian is now, uh, you know, been tamed by the, the cross, <laughs> so to speak. Well, looking at his story, I honestly believe that they had a wheel of cliches. And as they went along, they spun it. And whatever came up on the wheel is what they put into the story. So he was a drug addict. Okay, that goes in the story. He was a, he was a gang, so he belonged to a paramilitary organization. He had guns. Oh, my God. So that goes into the story. But what's funny to me is the way that they start off the story. They start off by trying to claim that women are not equal if you read the story properly, in the first three lines, he literally says that his family was very religious and that his dad was very religious and everybody obeys his father. So he's trying to give the impression that the women don't have authority by placing all the authority on his father. But yeah. then, so again, this just seems really cliche to me. And moving on from that, he goes on to say, at first I was very religious very religious, he performed prayers and did the other, and okay, normal. But at the same time, he was doing drugs. He says that his life was extremely sinful at that point in time. So his yeah. story is not coherent. Either he was really religious or he was extremely sinful. He said that he was a musician, he used to get drunk and do drugs, he used to lie and steal from house guests. You can't be very religious and at the same time be doing those things. Yeah. So there seems to be a lot of uh, cognitive problems, yeah, a bit of a contradiction. 
Well, I mean, it's important. Yeah. To, it's important to note, though. Sorry about that, Yahya. I just wanted to jump in as a person that lives in the Middle East as well. I've seen the youth here um, and how they view religion, and I've even seen Iranian youth. Um, and they're number one. A lot of the young kids they're not raised with their religion at all. It's the same thing as even in the UK as well. And it's and if they're not raised upon their religion and they don't know anything, then they go into sex and drugs. And, and actually, they do other things as well. Um, and even some of them get into Satanism. Now, this guy was into music. And I've seen a lot of goth uh, people from Iran. We say it in Arabic, Iran, but Iran in Western, <laughs> the Western dialect. And um, the, I mean, it's just a stone's throw away. If, they're, if you don't have any religion at all, and then you're willing to sell it, and especially if you're a drug addict, you're willing to sell your religion for anything, your beliefs for anything to the highest yeah, bidder. But, but Abu, you look at the story he gives. He says he brought girls back to his house, the same house that his father and family were at. Are you trying to tell me that the family who was very religious and they belonged to an armed militia, armed religious militia, saw their son bringing girls home and they just waved it off? Good they didn't point. talk about it. That does not make sense. He says, in response to that, his dad talked about hell. So you, you, so you obey your father, that's what he says, but he brings girls back to the house. How, what is going on? Like I said, that story seems like cut and paste. All the bad things that they could put in, they're true in there. Drugs, alcohol, sex, talking about hell. They're trying to show that his father here, uh, sorry, that the Islam that his father followed could only talk about hell. It had no actual solutions. But yep. he knew that what he was doing was wrong. So again, this just seems, as Yahya said, like a typical asylum seeker story. That's what it seems to me. It does not seem meaningful, sincere. It just seems extremely cliched. I mean, I bet you right now, if I log into Pal Talk and go into a Coptic room, I'll be hearing the same stories. Literally, yep. Word for word, sometimes there is no difference, at least from my perspective. Yeah, it's very cliched in the way he criticizes Islam. It's like he's reading from a pamphlet or an evangelical tract. So he's saying things basically that he thinks they want to hear. The they here is his Christian sponsors. So, so they are those questions of sincerity. Going back to his claims of being religious, but I, actually, to be fair to him, when he says that uh, he brought girls back home, he probably did it in secret, if it's true. So mm. I, I doubt that his father was saying, yeah, bring them over. So, um, yeah. But, but you going know, back but you know him, yeah, yeah. But you know that if his dad was like majorly religious, he would be so afraid to even do that. It sounds like a typical Western family or liberal family were, if he got caught, eh, it's not going to be the end of the world. But there's religious dads, man. If, if they caught their son bringing a girl home, it would be hell on earth for them. <laughs> it wouldn't be something like little. It would be that some... guy would not be alive to go and get them. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you would kill him. But the, <laughs> there would be dads, <laughs> he would be, you know, he'd yeah. probably be, you know, he, there would be dads probably that would take them to jail for that. Or there would be, you know, because in the Middle East, they don't usually, honor killings, especially in the Middle East, they, they blow it, you know, they exaggerate that so much. I mean, I've seen cases where girls are messing around here in the Middle East and the dad just gets mad and hits them or something and the police come. And it's the same thing as in the West where domestic violence happens. It's just Muslims are just a little more sensitive when it comes to the concept of dating and what have you. But it's still... That kid's, if they're, if they're under 18, they're going to be, you know, grounded forever, you know, not like grounded for two weeks in, in California with a liberal family or something, probably grounded for a year, probably lose all their money, you know, their allowances or stuff like that. So for him to feel comfortable and to risk all that, it just, it sheds light on the type of family. It was probably an, a liberal Iranian family that was culturally Shia. And we should note that as well, that they were Shia. So this is a different theology and different belief system when it comes to Sunni Islam. And, uh, that's, and, and, and speaking of that, I'd like to now turn the conversation over to what, what was his uh, journey to Christianity? So he tried some other religions. Can you, can you cover this, uh, Yahya, for us? 
Is yeah, there... but, but before we go on to that, let's just touch on his nominalism or what he knew about Islam. The, 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 this person had no clue what Islam was. Just, let's just read this. Also, I was only ever told good things about Prophet Muhammad. He doesn't say Prophet That's Muhammad, it. but I put that in there. Peace be upon yeah. And And that we were to worship and pray to him. I thought, why should I? He's dead. Again, all mm. cliched, but no Muslim worships or prays to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So where's he getting all this from, right? Yeah. So he, he doesn't have that religious background. It's probably some sort of nominal, um, cultural Muslim background, if there was uh, a, such a background. Or maybe he's just making it up because he thinks that's what they want to hear. Yeah. But um, Yahya, I don't mean to cut across to you, but if they came from a religious Shia family, shouldn't he mention Ali, may Ali be pleased with him, or any of the Ahlul Bayt in that story? Because there's such a central focal point in Shiism. It, it's very difficult for me that they would speak about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but he would not mention the Ahlul Bayt. Absolutely yeah. he's silent on them. I mean, they literally call upon Ali, may Ali be pleased with him. Yeah, Ali, my dad. That, they say these things regularly. Yeah, Hussein, yeah, Fatima, yeah. all that. So why is this absent in the story? It seems almost as if he's pandering, he's perfandering, joke, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> to a specific exactly. audience, right? And it's almost like, as if he was spoon-fed what to say because that's yeah. what the Christian wants to hear. They want the compare and contrast we worship Jesus, Jesus, like what Robert uh, Moray said when I prayed, when he debated Shabir Ali, he said, when we pray to Jesus, something happens, you know, the, we, people are healed or what have you. But when you pray to Muhammad, nothing happens. And everybody's like, but he, he's got a healing story in there. He's got a healing story in there in the name of Jesus. My sister was yeah. healed. From wait, 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 MS. we'll cover that. We'll cover that. Hold on. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Now he says he prays to Muhammad, which, and then he said, Muhammad is dead. So, so, but also he, I mean, this shows that he doesn't know the, he hasn't delved deeply into the theology of Islam because when Muslims send their salat, or salam, when they, when they greet the Prophet, salam, Allah makes it where the Prophet can hear that greeting. So, and the compare and contrast of that, you know, of, of saying, well, Jesus is alive. Actually, Jesus died in Christian theology. Jesus is alive in Islamic theology. It's different. Jesus never did die. Je the atheists call Jesus, from a Christian standpoint, the zombie god. Because he, he died and came back to life. Whereas Islam, we don't believe that he actually died on the cross. He, he actually was, he, his, his age was frozen in time, just like in the story of, uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, with the people of the cave, where Allah froze the people's uh, aging process in time. And Allah is the creator of everything. He's the creator of time. He's the creator of, of our aging process. So if he wants to stop somebody in their tracks of aging, he can. So... Uh, it's it's like I said, it's a cliche statement. I don't know if anybody else wants to cover uh, or touch upon this. Well, what I did want to say was, okay, basic Islam, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Do you need anything more than that? When you, when you hear that, you know who you pray to. It literally tells you in the sentence who the God is, right? Allah, la ilaha illallah. Full stop, right? So he should know that whatever he, whenever he's praying, he's praying to Allah. It is Allah that conveys the salam upon the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the problem. Basic theology does, well, again, he was a Shia, so, well, allegedly a Shia. So maybe he had some other folk beliefs. We have absolutely no idea. The problem is here, this just sounds really cookie cutter to me. Something cut and paste, follow the script, and that should be it. Nothing about Shiism. They only mention Shiism once at the very top, and that's it. They never go on to explain what his beliefs in Shiism were. He mentions mullahs, but then he, he denigrates them. But of course, we know that the mullahs in Iran have problems. But he never explains his Shia theology. Never. So that says to me a lot. That silence about his own familial theology says a lot to me. If he can't speak about what he was before, then how can we know that this story is accurate in any sense? You know, it just does not make sense to me. Now, he does go on to say he invested other, other religions, right? So, Yahya, what religions did this guy investigate? 
um, here we go. So he looked into Zoroastrianism. So th this is, I guess he was getting into Iranian or Persian. Um, well, I guess it, you can't really call it nationalism, but um, he, he was getting into racial pride. So Zoroastrianism being the pre-Islamic Persian religion. So he, he checked that out, Zen Buddhism. Um, he was doing yoga classes. Um, what else was he doing? Did he, did he try Islam? Did he try Sunni Islam? Well, anyway? I mean, yeah, of course, that, that, that's just it. He didn't try Sunni Islam because I, I guess this is because the Shias, they look at Sunni Islam from a very negative angle. So he probably heard a lot of uh, propaganda about Sunni Islam. What's, I don't mean to cut you off, but what's funny to me is when he speaks about Buddhism and yoga classes, he actually says, you are so focused on yourself, you become your own God. But doesn't a belief in a Christian that the Holy Spirit is in you? I mean, come on, mm. the, the, the equivalence there is blatantly clear. I mean, you, you literally have to worship a human being who took on a human nature. God took on a human nature. So if he was so revolted or disgusted by self-worship or human worship, as he claimed above it, Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is not true, obviously. But if he's so revolted by such an idea, how can he then go on to worship a man? I mean... The, the the thinking here seems to be uh, really unsettling or or not uh, consistent, at least from my point of view. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a person that's living in the Middle East, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, due to geopolitics and what have you, it's Iran themselves, they raise a lot of the youth to have such hatred towards Sunni Islam that they would prefer to become a, a Christian before they would become a Sunni. And it's a big problem. And it just kind of shows you, when you hear what he's talking about here, it kind of shows you his mind frame, that he would rather go to a previous religion that was based in Persia and Iran than to try to look into Sunni Islam. But there's so many co theological contradictions even in that because you know, they, they have you know, anti-Arab sentiments because they consider themselves Persian. So they'll, but the Prophet Islam, even Ahlul Bayt, they're all Arabs, right? <laughs> one one yeah. problem I have Wait, here is that if you look at the story again, do you realize he never says he tried to study Shiism at all? Mm. He says that he went to a class and he asked one question and got hit on his hand. But did he ever go to a sheikh? Did he ever go to a madrasa? Did he ever try to seek answers? He never says he does that. Yeah. Never says he does that. And that, that bothers me. If this story is supposed to be taken seriously, then I have to say it's lacking in... Uh, it's really lacking in sincerity from my perspective. I cannot take it seriously. It honestly seems like a play for an asylum seeker. That's yep. what it yeah, seems. It's all to. contrived. That's just it. It's, it's contrived. For, uh, let's let's be sure here. So so people are certain. We're not trying to pile on Iranian asylum seekers here. I, yeah. I don't blame an Iranian wanting to get out of Iran. That's no offense to that country. I don't know anything about that country. Mm -hmm. Never been there. I probably will never go there. I've got no intention to. But they're probably looking around. So they being the Iranians, they're looking around, seeing Syria being decimated through Western policy, foreign policy. Uh, same happened with Iraq. And they're probably thinking, this is going to happen to us soon. Do we really want to be living in a war zone? Let's get out. Well, it and might be, it so might be though, Yahya, it might be. You see, coming again, once again, coming from the Middle East, I've seen youth. If you're a partier, and you like drugs and sex and stuff, and you live in a society that is overtly religious, you look, at to, you look to the West as the pinnacle of freedom that you can go and party. And that's what you can't, all the youth here that are partying, ask anybody, They're still, they still remain Muslim, but they'll go, oh, and when they, when they get to college, they all just go crazy. They'll go, they'll go to the West, they'll start drinking and partying, and they'll get, go out and date girls because they can't do it back home. And that's what this guy, this is a quintessential, it's so cliche what happened to him. But the only thing is, the difference between him and the regular Arab kids and the Iranian kids that go to the West for studying and what have you is that this guy, he, he couldn't, in his story, he was looking for a way, and we're going to get to this right now, of how he wanted to get to the West. He was in Iran, he was looking, he was drinking, he was playing music, he was looking at pornography, he wanted to have sex and date girls. Um, and he wanted to find a way to go to the West. And now 
then, and this moves us to the next subject that he, uh, that he talks about, is he had a friend, an Iranian friend in the UK that he knew of, but come to find out he converted to Christianity. So, uh, Yahya, can you uh, enlighten us more of what happened here? <laughs> Let me just uh, find the relevant part. One second. All right, all right. I'll explain it. I'll explain it, yeah, and then you you can uh, <laughs> and then you can uh, you know make a comment on it. So, what happened was his friend, right? He's he's from Iran. He went to the UK. I don't know if he was studying or what, but he had a friend there. That's just all he says. And he said, and then come to find out, he sends an email to him, and come to find out. He's a Christian as well. So I'd, I'd like to know his conversion story, but it's probably the same thing, you know, because birds of a fe feather, you know, they flock together. So he's probably drinking, partying, looking at pornography. <laughs> and, and this guy even admits, he said, I was searching the Internet for pornography when I got an email from him. And it said, I think you need this in the subject line. And he says, in the subject line, it was John 3.16. <laughs> So, and then as we know, John 3.16, it's, I mean, this verse itself, I mean, there was some controversy behind it. I remember when I was in the U.S., I remember in the churches there, because I visited a couple churches, they used to have a, a, a changed or a variant version of John 3.16. What was it? It was, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But of course, here he's saying uh, he gave his only son. I, I'm wondering, <laughs> I wonder if he sent him the actual, the old version. Now, most, most churches won't have that. But I just find it quite amusing that what converted him to Christianity was a passage that had been changed and manipulated and exploited by Christians <laughs> for, for, you know, centuries beforehand. <laughs> so, uh, Ijaz, uh, do you want to comment on this since you're the textual critic? Well, <laughs> Well, uh, not a textual critic, but it does say ton monogene edukin, right? The word here being monogene, but simply, well, it's not supposed to mean begotten, but that's the translation that was given, I think, in the KGV, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, just from my perspective, again, if I go back to his story, he said that he found difficulty with worshiping the Prophet, peace be upon him, which again, we don't do, but that is what he said, what he said. He had difficulty worship in a human being and then he goes on to believe that god has a son and is a human being i mean if this guy is consistent in his theology if he could reject the one previously then he should reject this one as well but he doesn't what changed for him to accept human worship that that does not make sense to me so the very that we've been given does not fit well together now again the problem here uh, the word Mongene being translated as begotten. Some translations change that now to mean unique or own or special, uh, not necessarily something that is physical, right? Mm. Because they want to separate metaphysical from the God, which is spirit. You know? That's what they teach. So just from a theological perspective, they played it safe by not giving the KJV translation, right? So we have to ask yeah. ourselves, what version of the translation did he get originally? And which version this way on that bracelet that they said he was wearing? What version did he give them? If he gave them the begotten version, would they consider him a true Christian? Yeah. That's the question to ask. Yeah, here, he yeah, here. on your channel, sorry about that, Ijaj. On your channel, it. you have a lot of fake um, conversion stories, right? And they, and they get exposed. And we come to find out that they don't barely know anything about Islam. Uh, oh, can you yeah. recall any? Can you recall any? Um, crikey, and now you've put me on the spot. Let me just. I, I know in Speaker's Corner, the guys always put these guys and expo you know, expose them. They're like, yeah, I was, I was a devout Muslim. And they're like, okay, recite Surah Al Fatiha. And the guy can't do yeah. it. And yeah. I mean, that, that's <laughs> the my, favorite, my favorite one is what do you say in the fourth rakah for Witter? <laughs> what, was, what, was just <laughs> what was that? What was that? What do you, you recite in, in this fourth work of Ritter? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but mind you, I guess some Muslims won't even know that. So, uh, well, yeah, maybe. But I mean, that goes to sh if, if the person is religious, though, yeah. and they're saying I'm religious, that's yeah. you know the one of the first things that you're going to be learning in prayer, you know, of the Sunnah Salat. 
you know, yes. as that Witzer is three or one, you know. Three, yeah, exactly, yeah. It's, it's an odd number, you know, so, or five or yeah, seven. But, or, but we, used, we used to do that on Pal Talk, and I'm not joking, you'll get them one after the other, usually Coptic Christians per reading as ex-Muslims, and they would actually give you an answer. They would tell you that they would recite to an nurse or al-ikhlas. That's what they would do. And we would be laughing because you caught them out. And I believe Ergon Kina had a similar situation at some point, you know, with the guy trying to speak Arabic or just babbling along. It's really embarrassing to pretend that they're religious and you find out they were not religious at all. No, it doesn't mean that this individual was not religious, but he says he was religious. He says he was in the drawers, all, all these things. He says he became uh, agnostic, Zen Buddhism, etc. Yeah, but uh, he just what I find interesting here is he didn't go the other way and make out that he was like some sort of former imam. R generally, this is what I see with these fake conversion stories. They make out like they were uh, a, a former imam and they were in the middle of a mosque. There's a guy called Zach Gariba. He was a former imam. He was in the middle of the mosque and all of a sudden he was inspired to say, uh, Jesus... Uh, uh, something like that, Jesus, peace be, not, not peace be upon him, he, he proclaimed Jesus in the middle of uh, the prayer, apparently. So uh, they normally try and overplay their religious, religiosity, but this guy didn't do that. He went the other way, so he's clearly in league with the evangelicals who want to hear a real conversion story where somebody's in the uh, pits of hell, you know, he's the worst human being ever, he's doing all sorts of uh, vile sins, and then all of a sudden, he finds Jesus, and then he becomes a really pious human being. So, yeah. I, he's gone down that route. Well, which yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The, the Turk, generally, when you get these stories, either they were sheikh or imam, or they were terrorist, one of the two, because that shows religiosity. And this time, I guess this guy genuinely was not well educated about Islam, so they couldn't go down the imam sheikh route. They had to go down the terrorist. He was in a religious military group. So that's the group they went down, like that guy, uh, Shubat, you know, um, which well, we did find out that was fake eventually. But he just... Um he wasn't part of a terrorist organization, was he? He's yeah. made out that he was part of some sort of religious faction, but upon closer scrutiny, isn't that not just um, a wing of the army? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah, I believe. It's a it's, it's, organization. Yeah, it's almost, like, remember, it's almost like the Boy Scouts. I, I don't know if you guys, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have realized this, but in the article, they've made a mistake. And I want you to pay attention to it. He mentions that he belonged to an armed religious group called the Basijis, okay? And later down, he says he was trying to preach to a man about Jesus, a taxi driver. And he also called him a Basiji. So it, it almost seems as if this is a term he's using, generally speaking, to mean religious, not necessarily someone who's an armed religious person, even though the term specifically refers to an armed religious person. So I don't know if he gave Pafanda this name or if they put it in there to give the impression that almost everyone well, in the world... It might be, it might be two normal, things. Everyday taxi driver belong to the armed religious group. Yeah, it might well, be it, two it says things. Basiji. They use the exact same word. At least to me, it looks fishy to me on the surface. Yeah. Well, I think, I think either it's, it's either two things. It's either that, that he was saying that the taxi driver was a part of that group as well, or they, in maybe... Well, that's really lucky. Yeah. Or then maybe in Persian, you know, a taxi driver in the group, they have similar names. <laughs> <laughs> Guy who drives that fast. That could be a you know? very good possibility. <laughs> yeah, like you just wave down the, you just, you know, stick your hand out. Hey, I need a taxi. He stops, he pulls up. Where do you want to go? Oh, take me to the militia. You know, it's where yeah. going. No, he's like, you want a taxi or a caution <laughs> cop? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> then you could see, I wonder if like an Iranian terrorist went to the West and he didn't, <laughs> and he wanted he's to get a gun. And, and he keeps buying taxis by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want Basiji. You don't understand Basiji? Yeah, taxi. Here you go. <laughs> oh, All right, so let's move the conversation. Now we're talking about his background. Okay, all, all the nonsense. Um, now, now he converted. So then he says he was sent by the guy, the email. And then he says, as I read it, 
it was as if lights come on oh like in the movies i guess sir and uh, and uh, and i've been brought to life a god that w- uh, would give his son for me i thought who is god who is this god i want him okay i spent two three four hours on my knees crying <laughs> <laughs> saying sorry to God for everything I'd done. Okay, interesting thing. Why didn't he... He Now, in the article, he was talking about how the Islamic God, he's always talking about, you know, his father's talking about hell and that he always felt bad about what he was doing. But yet now when he converts to Christianity, he's also guilty. You know, he's feeling guilt, right? I mean, and, and I mean, Christianity also has a hellfire. Why... I don't understand why they always try to have this moral high ground with us Muslims that, you know, oh, well, our God is love. No, your God also burns non-believers in hellfire. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jesus looks what he says in the New Testament, that not everyone who calls upon him will get into heaven, right? He will reject them. But let me just point out something here, something that seemed really weird to me. He says that he used to recite the Quran in Arabic, but he didn't know what it meant. Yeah. yeah. But he, all, he goes on to say now that he's quoting the Bible, but he's reading it in English, not in Greek. It's the same problem, just inverted. So he found a problem with quote-unquote Islam that he could not resolve. And then when he converted quote-unquote to Christianity, that problem, he didn't think about it. He didn't cater to that problem. Yeah, why didn't, so he, get the, scripture, why didn't he get the Quran in English? If he, got the, I, if he was so moved by the <laughs> Bible in English, why couldn't he have gotten... Because he was busy searching for pornography. Didn't yeah. you listen to his story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You want to jump in on this, man? <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, I think we need to wrap this one up right now. Um, so his family disown him for six months. Then he starts sharing the gospel with them, quote and unquote. He heals um, his sister from um, MS, multiple, multiple sclerosis. sclerosis. Yeah. Yeah. And he mentions uh, in Jesus' name. So he seems uh, a bit charismatic. Um but, okay, hold uh, up, hold again, up, hold it's, up. It's all yeah, 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 yeah. Hold up. Now, this is a theological point, and if James White or any other apologist is listening to this, this guy makes a mistake, a theological mistake here. And I'd like to point this out because he said that he healed a non believer through his prayer. But actually, the concept is, is that God, sin, sin and disease, according to their theology, is of the same thing. So they'll say that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for diseases for that's what they'll say, especially these faith healers people that we'll get to later. Um, but the way that you would be healed, God allowed disease on this earth because we fell to sin that all the negativity on this earth is because of our, you know, because of the sin of Adam, but for you to be healed and to have that removed from you, you have to first accept Jesus according to them. So how, you know, and I'd like to explain this, Yahya. How is it then that his sister would be healed then if she didn't believe, right? But uh, will you take this into consideration? He claims that he healed her in Jesus' name. Did she become a Christian? Mm. No. Did his no. parents become Christians? No. No. They did not believe that she was healed because of Jesus. Now, let's assume that his father would never convert no matter what. If you went from a serious disease, and I'm speaking as a person with a serious disease, if you had a, mirac- a miraculous transforming experience where you were sick and then healed, you would convert if you saw that something uh, caused that healing, right? I mean, that, that's just natural. You would want to go to that healing. But here's the problem here. The sister does not do that. Yeah, exactly. If she, if she sincerely believed, okay, well, you know, my brother converted and I was healed because of his prayer. Maybe I should convert too. But he says that he's still ministering to them. But says to me that this story does not add up. It simply means to say she may have been healed in some way via medicine or she may have been healed through prayer in Islam. We don't know. Let's assume she was healed, but he is ascribing the healing to him. So what he did, that seems egoistic, it seems selfish, it seems it almost seems as if he wants to take credit for something that he did not do. And that to me shows the kind of person that he is. Uh, this is not sound like a sincere person to me. I'm very sorry. Yeah. But that's assuming that all this is true. I mean, for, for all we know, he's just making it up because he thinks the audience wants to hear it. 
So, well, yeah, let me be quite honest. As far as I know, the founder ministries is one of the most honest uh, uh, ministries. <laughs> Sorry. This is we we turned the podcast to stand up comedy, man. <laughs> we have just just so you know, one of uh, funders' uh, associates. Um, the FSA, that's the Financial Services Authority. Oh, I uh, thought you meant the Free Syrian Army, but okay, continue. <laughs> no, they, they have the same number of victims, man. <laughs> so, oh my God. Uh, yes. So one of their affiliates or one of their associates, he, his honesty has been denounced by um, the FSA, the uh, Financial Services Authority in the UK. Apparently he was a, a financial advisor back in the day and they investigated him and they, they couldn't see him as a, an honest individual, honest or untrustworthy individual. But And Jay Smith, he's got a, a, a record of uh, a lack of honesty. Well, well. But, uh, well, well, speaking from personal experience, and people should know this, when I wrote my paper <laughs> responding to Jay Smith, literally every reference the guy gave was wrong when I compared what he said on stage versus the quotes that I read. And let's just make this clear. He claimed he was going to respond to me, and he never did. Do you know why? You can't respond to the users, the quotes that you meant to use. So when I say that profile is very uh, uh, sincere, honest, and that they have a good sense of integrity about them, I'm joking. I'm not being serious. I, have, I, I need to be quite honest here. Uh, when you go to Hyde Park and you listen to uh, Jay Smith standing up and shouting, you don't get anything from it. You don't get sincerity from him. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of the day, this story just seems like something made up. I mean, it seems like the fiction that you would find in the New Testament. I mean, I believe the New Testament is fiction, but I mean, this just does not seem sincere, well, honest. I mean, I think, what do you I think, think I don't that? think that Jay Smith or these any of these uh, Christian apologists ever got a real knowledgeable Muslim to convert. They've never to convert to Christianity. Never. You know, because you, if you know the religion, you can see that they are lying and manipulating in their articles. All you need to do is just do a fact check and just go. And I, I remember when I first got into apologetics in 2011, I started going and reading these guys' articles. And of course, at that time, I didn't know a lot of their arguments. And then I would spend, you know, an hour fact checking everything. And every single time it was a, it was a misrepresentation, a lie purposely. You can read in the article that they are purposely misrepresenting and reaching false conclusions and doing a smoke screen or, you know, well, smoke well, and mirrors. You, you, know? you just reminded me of something. Yeah, um, There was a, a research paper done by Dr. Atakulic from Turkey, right? Mm. And at the beginning of this paper on the top copy manuscript, he says that research on this codex has never been done before, right? Jay Smith took that line, <laughs> he put it into a slide and he says, you see, they've never done research on it. It's on the introduction to the 2000 page research. You know? <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, what the hell is going on with these people? But do, do you know that he's made claims of having converts? He's, he, he said that last year or the year before, they had hundreds of converts one year, in one year and uh, he, he never put them on camera. And yep. his excuse was, oh, you know what will happen. He, he was on uh, Justin Bradley's show, P uh, Premier Christian Radio. That guy questioned him and he said, where are these converts? Yeah. Right? Well, well, and he asked the them, oh, are they British converts? Right? He, yes. said, no. he said, yeah, the British converts. Uh, in my opinion, I think they, they are asylum seekers like this Sadek guy. But he never put them on camera, even though he puts Hatun Tash on camera. So but, yeah, yeah, consider this. So they're going to kill it. They're going to kill them. Uh, but yeah, here he put ridiculous. this guy's picture and name up on his website. If he's genuinely afraid of that, why is he putting this guy's picture and name up on his website? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then they've got Hatun Tash with them. And another point uh, here is um, James White. Sorry, not James White. Crikey, uh, James White's going to kill us for mentioning his name here. James maybe Smith, you, maybe you. I, I yeah, think I'm probably <laughs> me. You know, me and James White, we don't really get on. But anyway, James Smith. He, he's getting really wacky in his old age. I don't know if any of you guys know, he claimed Muslims have banned um, the selling of pork products in Harrow. Harrow is like a suburb or part of, it's part of London. Mm. And it has a population of about 200,000. If he really genuinely believes that Muslims have banned pork in Harrow, 
the guy is off his rocker. He's literally no. off his rocker. In, in all truth, yeah, yeah, this is the problem with apologetics and Christianity right now. Even in Western countries like liberal Christians, the, De- the Democratic Party, everybody is shaking their head at the right-wing Christians because they're, they're in their bubble and they've been lying so much. See, it, when the war on terror started and all this, the internet and the Christians started attacking Islam, you know, Robert Moore and all this stuff, Nobody, we Muslims were like, you're lying. You're, these people are lying to the West. These guys are lying. And nobody took us seriously. And I knew eventually that this was going to spill over. They were going to see the successes with Islam and what they're doing with our religion. And it's going to spill over to other stuff. You know, all those fake numbers about Christians being killed, the stories of them being killed in Iran or, you know, in Somalia or Sudan. I mean, there are people that die, but they... They talk about, you know, they rewrite history and, yeah. you know, say that two, I forget, 200 million people have died throughout history or some nonsensical number. And what happened was, is in the last, you know, five years or so, it spilled over to politics and other everyday life. And, and people are just shaking their head because these people are, you know, liars. They just, they have no real concept of or self-awareness of how ridiculous they look. And, and, you know, alhamdulillah, I thank Allah that it's actually spilled over like with Donald Trump and it's, it, it, it's gone into the politics because now people yeah. are realizing like, you know, now we're saying, look, we told you so that they were lying and they're misrepresenting facts. You see what they're doing in politics with you guys? That's what they've been doing with us for the last 15 years. You know, so alhamdulillah, I mean, there's a positive thing in this. And, J- and, and, and Jay Smith doing this with his, you know, uh, oh, pork is being banned. They did that before, right? Jonathan yeah. McClatchy said that there was no go zones. Fox News did it, you know. And I mean, it, it, and because they're because in church service, they're in their own little bubble in their church. They can say crazy stuff. Oh, you know, this if you go if you go to the Middle East and just say Jesus, you'll get your head chopped off. Yeah, and over exaggerate yeah. stuff like that. And, and I mean, they, they try and get this uh, poor Sade guy to go into that area as well because they ask him, oh, "Aren't you afraid? You know, aren't you afraid of doing ministry to Muslims?" And then he he goes off into um, a spiel of bravado. You know, I'm shielded with Jesus's love, etc. And uh, he, the guy, is in the UK. There's no threat to him. Nobody yeah. knows where specifically he is in the UK. What, what are the statistics, uh, Yahya, in the UK? How many people, I don't even think you can count on your hand, that were killed for apostasy in the UK? Maybe, I, I don't think even there think there's one. one person in the 80s. Apart from that, there was nobody. There's, there's been nobody. And Sharia, do, in non-Muslim lands, that law of apostasy doesn't apply anywhere, right? So it's, Yahya, it's immaterial I, in the UK. I don't mean to cut you guys off, but I just haven't gone to Profundo's website. Um, do you ever actually see them bring in Christian white converts, people who have fell out of Christianity and come back to it? Because all they seem to give us Great are, are immigrants. Immigrants, yeah. to be, even J. Smith is an immigrant, to be honest. They, <laughs> they, seem to, they seem to target a specific section of the community in the UK. Immigrants, people who are downtrodden, who don't have homes, who don't have money, who are seeking shelter from terrorism and wars and these kinds of things. These are easy targets. Why don't they target religious, I'm sorry, irreligious Western Caucasian people? I mean, the, the same thing's happening in Germany. I made the point when um, p- people like Tony Costa, they send those, these stats about Iranians converting in Europe, etc. Germany, uh, you, 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 you do the numbers and you look at actual German Muslims, people born there, citizens, none of them are converting. Why yeah. is it only the asylum seekers? It's two plus two equals four, but these people never get the answer for it. They, they well, want to believe well, that the Holy Spirit is working, etc. Well, yeah, yeah, I want to point out something here. Just remember that Tony Costa was angry at Muslims being allowed to pray in schools, right? There in Toronto. But when I was there in Toronto, I can tell you factually, the vast majority of people there, the native people there, they don't care about Christianity. The religion is literally almost gone. Yeah. People like Tony Costa are becoming irrelevant day after day. People like Jay Smith are becoming more irrelevant day after day because the, the, 
their own neighbors, their own communities are leaving Christianity. They've just become lay Christians, nominal Christians. Whereas you see that the Muslim communities are buying churches to convert them to masjids, you know. We are mm-hmm. expanding. I mean, you go, and I'm telling you this, I went to a khutbah by uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, right? My first time going to his uh, Islamic uh, Dawah Center. And let me tell you, the cross-section of people I saw there blew my mind. People from maybe over a dozen countries, different races, people that could barely speak English, but they came for his khutbah. But when you go to like a certain Baptist churches, they're literally called the Chinese Baptist church. You only have one cross-section of community that yeah. is actively Christian there. But you go to someone like Dr. Shibu Ali's masjid, you get dozens. You, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but when I went to Nam, or I went to um, that masjid in Etibeko, uh, I'm telling you, the cross section I saw Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, people from the Caribbean, oh my God, so many people from my own community were there. I was amazed. Alhamdulillah. I just want to close off by saying this my final thoughts, right? Whether the story is true or not, and I don't believe it is true. Even if it is true, the kind of person represented here is not a person anyone should emulate. He does not study theology. He is inconsistent in the way he approaches theological issues that he encounters. He seems to have a violent past. Um, I wouldn't trust my daughters around him, and I don't even have daughters, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. I, the, the point I want to get across is I thank the Ministry for providing some entertainment for me. Reading these stories are entertaining to me because you can clearly see right through them. You can see all the cliches that they've used. And at the end of the day, I walk away as a stronger Muslim when I read these things from Profound Ministries. So I want to give a special thank you to Jay Smith for having Lizzie Schofield author such an amazing fiction of an article. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joseph Smith. And thank you, uh, Lizzie Schofield. <laughs> I pass it on to you guys. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'd suggest is for any listener, um, go, go away and read this person's story, right? And then go on YouTube, Muslim, search Muslim convert, listen to that story, and there's going to be a world of difference. There's going to be one that sounds sincere, one so- that sounds fiction and really insincere, and you'll know which one's which. Yeah. Look up stories like Yusuf Evans, Abdurrahim Green, um, Yusuf Estates. I mean, these were people that were pastors, real. And they know their Bible front and back. It's not um, a job. Jonathan Brown, they know their Bible. They knew their religion. This guy did not know his faith. He did not know the basic concept of monotheism, Tawheed. He was praying to Muhammad, peace be upon him. That would be the equivalent of us sharing a story of a Christian convert, you know, that was, you know, praying to Mary, you know, and considering her part of the Trinity, you know, or one of those or, 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 or a modalist or something like that, you know, just some type of uh, heretical denomination. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous, but it's not for Muslims, right? It's not, this story isn't for Muslims. It's, it's a feel good story for Christians um, that, Hey, now we're converting, you know, and I hate to say it from a colonialist point of view, we're converting the heathen, you know, we're converting those people over there that want, he was an ex, you know, not drug, drug addict, and then also terrorists. In the Middle East, not, the majority of the people aren't holding Klosh and Kofs and walking around with guns and trained with guns. You know, and they've got the other Hollywood stereotype of uh, Middle Easterners, somebody who's sex obsessed, you know, sees a woman and he can't control himself. He's got, he, they've yeah, got you, that. You might as well have had Arnold Schwarzenegger come in in the True Lies movie and <laughs> shooting as well. I mean, come on now. Uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And the guy, just like uh, Nabil Qureshi, that was Ahmadi, you know, these people, they're not, he was a Shia. And I know, I mean, I'm not going to bag on all Shia, but there are some denominations within their sect that do have, they're heretical groups. They do have, like like the Elohites, for example, where they actually pray to Ali and, you know, they believe that, you know, God can be incarnate and all this nonsense, you know, or they believe it's another form of pantheonism where they believe God is everywhere or something like that, where, you know. I did meet uh, an Alawite uh, um a Turkish uh, lady in London, and she had no clue what Islam was. Yeah, so, I mean, that's it, standard. and of course, then you're you're ripe for manipulation. Then, and if you're if you're praying to a man, like Ijaz said, if you can sit there and you're praying to a man, 
then your concept is already flawed and your theology is already flawed. But, and, and I'll just end on this point, I find it quite odd that there's so much focus on Islam, whereas atheism is on the rise in the West from every direction, you know, especially in the UK, right, Yahya? I mean, yeah, very much so. I mean, it, we're not, I mean, alhamdulillah, we're converting people and inshallah, you know, Islam will grow. And it, uh, CNN just released an article that by the end of the century, uh, Islam will surpass Christianity in numbers. Um, but that also has to do with them losing because of atheism. And they're sitting there trying to convert Muslims and, and taking advantage of, you know, of, of, of asylum seekers, people that are or refugees which is horrible, which looks to us Muslims and the people in the Muslim world, when we look at this, we just shake our heads and it makes us even more disgusted because you're taking advantage of somebody in their most vulnerable state, you know, and it's, it's, you know, and that's, that's the, you know, that's what you've left with the people when you're doing these things uh, with the Muslim world. And they wonder why, you know, there's so much, you know, there's so much animosity towards the West and the Middle East. And, you know, because you have these groups that come with, you know, with a smile on their face, but have an ulterior motive. And it's not, it's not genuine concern for the people. I would say atheists actually have more morality than even some Christians when it comes to thinking for the best of the people. Because you have refugees coming, and, they're, and in the West, and especially in the United States, you have the Democratic Party actually saying, we need to take in refugees because these people are being killed. And, w- and then you have Republicans on the right saying, no, these people only take in Christians. You know, is that, is that Christian for you to say something like that? And what type of message are you want to convert the Muslim world? But alhamdulillah, I thank Allah that you've exposed your, these people have exposed themselves for who they really are. They don't care about you. They don't care about your humanity. They only care if you're part of their faith. And that's that. That's not what Christianity is, and and or I wouldn't believe that that's what Jesus would have taught, and I don't believe that's what the Gospels teach. And I don't know. I don't. Maybe Yahya, you can end on this, or Ijaz. I don't know what happened to their faith to make them like this, but it's really sad because it's, you know, you would you shame on them. You what it is? Them. What it is 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 desperation. Um, uh, uh, a few months ago, one Sunday, I went to the mosque to do the Fajr prayer. So that's the morning prayer. And really early in the morning, you wouldn't expect anybody to be there. But there, there were a lot of people there. And the same day, I went to the church for uh, an observation. There were about 20 people there. But for the Fajr prayer, there was probably about uh, three or four times more, uh, more people there. There's hardly anybody in the churches. And... Yeah. That's what it is. It's desperation. And desperation leads to this silliness that they are um, involved in. 